for men who have greater access to certified and approved seeds and extension services, they base their preferences on higher yields, larger seeds, and market demand. Next slide. So while constraints for both male and female groundnut farmers exist in areas such as storage, product aggregation, aflatoxin control, and overall production yields, female groundnut producers routinely face additional constraints in assessing productive land and tenure rights, agricultural inputs, including fertilizers and pesticides, and have less access to extension services such as agricultural training information than male farmers. So acknowledging and understanding these differences is important for developing gender appropriate seed varieties, technologies, and tools along this value chain. So while there were common patterns of what male and female farmers did within groundnut value chains, roles also varied. In some communities, women are entirely responsible for groundnut production, from planting to harvesting to drying, while men are in charge of marketing. In other places, men work alongside women in the field and make production decisions together. And in others, storage, harvesting, weeding, and processing are considered predominantly female activities, while land pre preparation, applying fertilizer and chemicals, and transport to market are male. And in some countries, women also carried out duties on their husbands' groundnut plots before they invested time in their own. And in such circumstances, women also did the planting, harvesting, drying, sorting, and shelling. So groundnut production includes seed selection, land preparation, planting, harvesting, and processing. And in terms of production decisions, women make the production decisions about the groundnuts they produce, and in some cases also jointly make decisions on groundnuts that are on male managed plots or jointly manage. Males always made the decisions on their own groundnut plots, but of course the, that also varied contextually. The only outlier were Madame Siraz and Haiti who managed the entire production process. And for those not familiar with Madame Siraz, these are women traders who are generally micro to small traders and move goods between markets and aggregate up to larger retail points. So due to women's overall disadvantaged position in custom customary and statutory land tenure systems across the developing world, female groundnut farmers commonly have smaller, less productive land than male farmers. In general, plot size are smaller and productivity is lower on female only plots than male plots. And on average, they range from 0.2 to 2 hectares, with 0.2 to 0.5 hectares being the most common. And while I attempted to come up with an average plot size for male farmers, this information was not available. In situations where women might have access to improved lands, it's usually lent to them by, female, to, by family members, oftentimes their husbands on a temporary basis. Women's plots tend to be farmed less intensively than men's, in part due to this, their reduced access to financial capital, land that's smaller and less productive, as well as limited access to improved seeds and information on improved farming techniques. In terms of what men, male and female um, farmers want on what constitutes the right seed for them, they select their seeds based on their preferences. When women tend to choose what they know, what works for them in cooking and food preparation, and ease of uprooting and, and shelling. Men, again, as I had said earlier, prefer higher yields, larger seed, and market demand. And I will note that these are the areas that are commonly researched for seed improvement. Women tend to use saved seeds while men buy certified seeds. And certified seeds can be a better choice because of aflatoxin control, pest, disease, climate resistance, and higher yields. So if we want women to improve, to use more certified seeds, the areas that need to be considered in include seed packaging sizes. Packaging is generally too large and costly for small scale producers, and that includes both male and female, but 
more geared towards female. Women need smaller packages than what men and may want packages a bit, men may want packages a bit larger. Certified seed information um, doesn't exist when people buy certified seeds and women get even less exposure to certified or improved seeds and need the experience in new seed varieties, um, using new seed varieties that meet their needs. In terms of seed storage, where certified seeds are used, they may not be stored correctly to avoid aflatoxin contamination. So both male and female farmers need information on how to appropriately store seeds. And then in terms of gender relevant characteristics of, of groundnuts, understanding the groundnut characteristics that both men and women want across geographies and evaluating whether current or newly developed certified seeds have these characteristics is important for uptake. And because of women's smaller land, land size and, and um, output, we need varieties that um, adapt to that. So in terms of um, disease and pest management, men and women use different knowledge systems. In, in some countries, women do not generally apply agrochemicals for possible reasons, including pregnancy, ill-fitting equipment for male sizes, or ability to afford them. But instead, they use local herbs and traditional me methods to control common diseases and pests. Men, on the other hand, are more apt to use agrochemicals, and we need to improve those opportunities opportunities um, to use the knowledge that women have to improve uh, the, those traditional practices for disease and pest management. So groundnut processing includes drying, storage, selling, sorting, pressing, and milling, and women are typically in charge of the harvesting and post-harvesting activities. Groundnuts are, are processed into a variety of products in homes and in processing mills of varying capacity. And small scale processing is mainly done for household consumption, although if women have leftover um, surplus, they sell it to local um, at a very small scale, typically as a part-time um, occupation. Both men and women were found to work in milling factories with more men in managerial or leadership positions. Men and women work, appear to be paid the same amount, but men overall work longer hours due to fewer household obligations and they may earn more than women. Drying and storage. Groundnuts are typically stored and left on the fields or in homes to dry until sold or consumed by households. While some farmers store groundnuts in jute, polyethylene bags or recycled bags that previously stored other crops such as rice, sorghum, beans, or cocoa. Um, some of these also, um, if they're not stored properly, they increase aflatoxin contamination. One of the prior um, PIML programs proposed solar dryers, but it's not clear if these were successfully adopted or scaled to other places. Shelling is commonly by hand and by women. Farmers commonly wet their pods to soften their shells, which makes it easier for them, but it in increases the risk of bacteria, fungus, and aflatoxin. There have been attempts to in introduce mechanical shelling machines, some which are manual and some of which have been electrical. Um, of course, the electrical shellers were preferred and were the easiest to use, but they have not been readily available or affordable. Sorting. Um, sorting is generally considered a women's role. Women shell their own groundnuts, men's groundnuts, and are again hired to sort in milling factories. Women often allocate their best peanuts for sale and unfortunately consume peanuts of lower quality that are unknowingly contaminated with aflatoxins. This indicates that the high risks of aflatoxin contamination is important and that information is not sufficiently disseminated to growers households and consumers, particularly women who have less access and mobility than male farmers. So as you can see, there's a whole slew of additional female constraints um, in addition to the, the constraints faced by all farmers. And you know, this includes mobility, less time, um, they have irregular and limited production amounts, 
They have less cap, um, cash for inputs. They have limited influence in household decision making. They have less ac access to updated information. Um, and I, I mentioned most of these already, so I won't go through every single one, but you can see there's a whole list. So in terms of recommendations, um, there were a, throughout the document, there are a number of recommendations, but I'm gonna list the, fi the top five um, that are mentioned at the end of the document. Um, and these top five are to ensure women are benefiting from and have access to new seed varieties, tools, and technologies appropriate to their roles and responsibilities in groundnut production and in processing. So the first one, um, acknowledging women's roles, knowledge, and needs. So as, you, as we all know, women are central to groundnut production and use groundnuts primarily to feed their families and supplement household income when possible. They face enormous and disproportionate constraints in land size, productivity, mobility, control over resources, cash and productive rice uh, markets, among others. The amount of time women spend on their groundnuts is limited by their other household obligations. So given the multitude of roles and responsibilities women have in groundnut production, we need to better understand what these are and how they differ from men's in devising appropriate interventions along this value chain. So in seed preferences, in developing new seed varieties, male and female traits need to be considered as well as the associated changes for male and female farmers in growing, harvesting, and processing. This includes time, size of area needed, et cetera, and the implications for adoption, workload, and profit. If we want to stimulate greater seed certified and improved seed uptake, packaging needs to be relevant to all farmers in terms of size, cost, and information, and on the benefits of certified seeds, proper planting, harvesting, and storage. And because women normally save seeds, this might be an opportunity to work with female farmers on improved seed storage and marketing saved seeds as a product for sale. In identifying a technologies and, and practices that are appropriate, they need to be inexpensive. They need to not require outlays of large sums of money, and they have to be accessible to both men and women. Improving drying and storage practices and equipment and technologies need to take place at the household, community, and larger levels that meet the needs of female farmers, accounting for factors such as smaller harvest size, lower cost, and whether they're shelled or unshelled. There's potential for shared storage facilities to be developed where both men and women share spaces or separately by women's crops and men's crops. And it would be important to consider whether men and women will want to store together or separately, and this will probably vary um, contextually. Uh, aggregation would help farmers reduce aflatoxin levels sell to processors and receive and improve, improved prices as well as reduce individual risk. Aflatoxin control. Um, all farmers and consumers along the entire value chain need to better understand and know how to identify contamination at every stage, including choosing seeds, planting, harvesting, pest control, et cetera, as well as understand the health risks. Both male and female groundnut farmers need to value improved planting, harvesting, drying, storage, and processing techniques and have the knowledge, equipment, and incentive to apply them. So the last recommendation is to um, make more con connections with local and international organizations that work directly with women farmers and groups and know those social cultural issues of the country and that these organizations and the women they represent are involved as key stakeholders and players in research and project implementation. Community-based platforms including village um, savings and loan associations, village agent networks, trainer of trainers, community champions, study tours, et cetera, could be used to build context-specific interventions as well as including the private sector. And that 
is it. <laughs> Thank you. Now that I'm unmuted, thanks a lot. That was really interesting. Um, we'll have time for questions at the end. If you'll hang out, um, we'll um, read off some of those and continue the discussion uh, at the end. Uh, now we're going to hear from Helga. Um, if I told you her entire list of qualifications to talk to us today, we would be here more than an hour. Um, so <laughs> um, uh, today, uh, she's a visiting fellow at Cornell University's College of Ag and Life Sciences, um, specifically at AWARE, uh, Advancing Women in Agriculture Through Research and Education. Um, but for a, a couple of three decades before, she's been in Africa, um, first in Kenya, um, where she worked with CARI, is that how you say K-A-R-I? Um, uh, the Agricultural Research Institute there, concentrating on gender responsive research approaches. Um, and then later with the CGIR, um, as um, uh, where she co-founded um, African Women in Agricultural Research and Development. Um, she also now serves on the Peanut Innovation Lab's external advisory panel, uh, helping to see um, the best approaches to help us prioritize projects um, and integrate those important, important cost-cutting measures. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about the gender gap in international agriculture in general um, to help continue the conversation. So, Helga. Well, hi, everybody, and thank you very much for the <laughs> overwhelming introduction. <Elsa>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just um, thought um, researchers, scientists like to see uh, data that convinces them more sometimes than words. So to follow up on uh, Carol's talk a little bit, I wanted to show you data that were published in 2015 about uh, women's access, for example, to information and agricultural extension. So 5%, female farmers receive only 5% of all agricultural extension services over uh, 97 countries that were covered in a study by FAO and World Bank. And only 15% of the world's extension agents are actually women. Only 10% of total aid for agriculture goes to, um, also in, in agriculture, forestry, and fishing goes to women. Can we have the next slide? I don't think I need to comment on that. So this, uh, I hope you see the full slide because there is something uh, missing. It should show that an increase to a woman's income of $10 achieves the same improvements in children's nutrition and health as an increase of a man's income of $110. This is a study that was done uh, by the Committee on World Food Security and is based on data from Cote d'Ivoire. It might be extreme, but it tells you uh, very clearly that closing the gender gap in agricultural resources has benefits of, um, uh, to, at the level of the individual and uh, particularly at the household level. Okay, next slide. So this is um, data that was uh, published in October of 2015 by uh, UN Women and other UN organizations, what it means to close the gender gap. They came up with actual data on that. So here is an example from Uganda where the gender gap was uh, determined to be 13%. And if this gender gap uh, in agricultural production, if that was closed, it would lead to an increase in, in crop production of 2.8%, which would increase the agricultural GDP by $58 million and lift uh, almost 120,000 additional people out of uh, poverty per year. Um, I'm not sure I want to talk about this. Uh, is this interesting for breeders? Uh, I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll talk about it very briefly. Uh, you all may be aware that the 2000 
2016 World Food Prize went to the team that works on uh, the orange flesh sweet potato or orange sweet potato. And interestingly enough, they uh, contribute some of their success on the uh, inclusion of uh, gender considerations while they were doing their research. Um, why is this important? I can give you an example from Mozambique. Vitamin A deficiency affects more, affects over 70% of children under five years of age in Mozambique. And the orange sweet potatoes are um, very rich in, uh, in um, beta carotene, also the precursor of vitamin A. Interesting uh, is in this context, and Carol mentioned it, the orange sweet potatoes are not only higher yielding, but they are also not more labor intensive. So they uh, answer to a critical demand of uh, our time strapped uh, women and girls in uh, uh, particularly African countries. So what did the researchers do that is gender responsive? Uh, Jan Lowe and uh, uh, her co-authors report in a recent publication, control of land within the household has a significant effect on the probability of adoption. The lowest adoption was where plots were under exclusive male control. Another point that Carol mentioned, that it's really important to figure out these data. So unless you ask questions around these gendered issues, you would not be prepared uh, to consider this influence on adoption. Another thing they reported was special sessions were held for male leaders in the community as men in the household controlled how cropland was allocated. Results indicate that there was significant uptake of OS, also orange sweet potatoes, among those participating in the intervention and increased frequency of intake of all vitamin A rich foods, not just sweet potato, by children under two years of age, decreasing malnutrition and stunting. Um, the next slide will show you a few personal lessons that I have learned over my many years trying to assist researchers to integrate gender considerations uh, in their research. And uh, here are sort of my personal um, top four. It is really important if you want to empower uh, women and girls, you need to work with men and boys as supporters and champions. The other one is that if, you, if people are gender aware, it doesn't mean that you immediately have transformative results of your, of your scientific work. Um, training in appropriate gender tools for researchers is really critical. I'll come to that also in the, my last slide. Gender responsive communication plays an important role also in removing barriers. A lot of what uh, Carol has been talking about has to do with barriers that are socially or culturally constructed and that uh, we need to help remove or overcome to be able to close this gender gap that I was just uh, talking about. And most importantly, do no harm. Um, if you think about developing technologies, please think about potentially unintended consequences. Um, so ensure that interventions do not reinforce, for example, men's authority as head of households or screwed control over critical resources or add to women's and girls already more than substantial labor burden. Now I want to come to three more very uh, practical issues. Um, I have recently reviewed some of those proposals um, for the first two um, topics of the Peanut Innovation Lab. And I want to remind you that you please budget for gender responsiveness. Um, a lot of the teams have mentioned gender in their proposals and some have addressed it even in more detail but nobody in those proposals that I reviewed had uh, put one dime in the budget for the uh, planned gender work. Um, you have to remember that all those focus group discussions or the surveys or the feedback meetings that you are planning to do 
all your monitoring and, and evaluation and learning have a cost. So please don't forget to budget for those. And also um, collecting sex disaggregated data, which is really critical for the work that you want to do and you want to be successful in having impact, can be more time consuming and might require additional training of the enumerators. So all of this needs to be planned for in terms of time and money for you in your proposals. Uh, another issue that, uh, can we go back to the last slide, please? Another issue that um, Carol addressed was women's uh, limited access to information. But please, you will all have noticed that there is really a revolution of um, uh, the penetration of mobile phones, even in the very rural areas of developing countries and particularly in Africa. So. Um, I want to encourage you that even if women are less mobile or girls as well, um, particularly in, for example, Muslim uh, societies, more and more women farmers actually own mobile phones and have access sometimes even to the internet, if not individuals, then maybe through their women's groups. Um, so using those for both ways for uh, releasing information, sharing information with women and girls, but also, um, you know, collecting data could be an innovative tool that you might make use of. And it's probably less expensive than sending a, somebody there all the time to the rural areas. Next slide, please. This is just um, um, some links to useful resources that uh, I guess Alison will share these um, slides with you. And so I wanted to give you these links. For example, if you wanted to um, look at your indicators, um, thinking about how uh, to make them gender responsive, FAO has just a one sheet kind of checklist, uh, a core set of gender indicators that you'll find there on their website. And then, uh, some of the programs, um, projects uh, want to use uh, PROWEA, also the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, um, customized for at the project level, which is currently being developed by um, IFPRI and ODI and, and USAID. So you can find an introduction to that at this link, but it's, I do not think that the tool is quite available yet, but you could contact the, um, the people who are working on that. Again, uh, tools and costs of gender work um, are very clearly explained in this next um, piece of um, this next document, particularly on page 10. If you're interested in what might it cost, please look at that. Next slide, please. Oh, of course, I want to uh, make you aware that there is a, a course for um, researchers, gender responsive researchers equipped for agricultural uh, transformation that was recently developed by Cornell and Macquarie universities and currently is actually ongoing, uh, one of the courses. Um, so we, we have not yet seen a critical change in agricultural research institutions paying attention to gender. Um, and Carol's guidelines are fabulous to help you, um, especially if you look at the bullet points and the highlighted areas on how you can um, improve your approach to make it more gender and use responsive. But what my experience has shown that it is much easier if you attend a training that helps you um, practice these tools, learn about the tools, practice these tools, and practice also the skills on how to communicate um, in gender responsive way and how to formulate policies in a gender responsive way. Um, this course includes um, two training sessions that are um, in Uganda, and in between, so they're both about a week long, in between four to six months of field work that is accompanied uh, through mentoring and uh, backstopping by the trainers um, and gender experts. Um, the, the researchers come in teams, um, best uh, biological scientists together with um, a social, social scientist and um, preferably a gender expert if there is one. And um, 
interestingly enough, uh, communities of practice, uh, practice have emerged from this, and I can only encourage you to look up at the to look up the um, course and and its details on the website, Great Agriculture. And um, yeah, that's the end of my contribution. I wish you good luck in all your projects, and I look forward to working with you if you want any okay. information. Thank you. Thank you, Helga. If you'll stay with us, because we're going to have questions shortly. Um, uh, we intend to introduce you to Jessica Marner Kenyon now. Um, she is in Rwanda, finishing up her research um, before returning to the U.S. to join the team here at the Peanut Innovation Lab. Um, those of you who've lived in Africa uh, know how um, the internet does not always work with you when you're ready to talk to people. Uh, she was on a uh, Skype call not too long ago and logged into our webinar and then we lost her. Um, however, um, oh, here she is. Yes. Back on. There she is. Oh, and there she went. Um, so I will uh, go ahead and introduce her. We'll see if she's able to join us. Um, Jessica is joining um, as the gender specialist for the lab, the first um, full-time role that, that this innovation lab has had in that area. Um, she's finishing up her PhD in geography um, from uh, University of California at Santa Barbara, um, where she focused on human dimensions of global change. Um, uh, has done a lot of development studies in agrarian transformation in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, she sent up some very detailed notes about um, no, no. what she wanted she to share. I mean, she may not have a video, but we can just ask you all to Right. If she can. can you unmute her mic and see if they can hear I can't her? Be oh. able to. She won't yeah. be able to. Um, well, mm -hmm. So, Helga and Carol, if you'll rejoin us, we'll go ahead and um, take some. We're unmuting Jessica to see if we can hear her. Oh, but she lost it. Um, Carol, can you rejoin us? Are you still here? I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yes, but we can't see you. Can you? Um, oh, sorry about that. Sorry. Hold on. Let me. Jessica's on. Oh, great. Jessica, can you hear us? Oh, hello. Oh, we cannot hear you. We can see you. Aww. Oh. <laughs> How's your sign language? Yes. <laughs> no. No. Try unmuting. No, her. She said. Seven issues with the mics. Okay. Okay. Um, so we'll maybe um, Jessica's notes were, were quite in depth, and some of it was covered uh, by by comments. Um, it's hard hard to summarize your your comments. She, she was very very prepared and sent us some long notes, but they're they're hard to uh, decipher uh, key points by me in the few minutes that we've had them here. Um, so maybe while I look at them, we'll look back at the list of questions that we had. Um, there were a few questions. Uh, Daniel Bailey from USA had, had talked about that are related to what I'm seeing on some of uh, Jessica's points about there's uh, trade-offs sometimes between some of the interventions that we generate for, say, labor saving, like a, a cropping system that would reduce or mechanization that might end up um, reducing labor, uh, paid labor uh, options for, for women. I think that was your point, Daniel. Um, so how do we uh, consider the desired benefit of labor saving and mitigate some of the negative outcomes of uh, women's economic empowerment? Um, Helga, Carol, do you have uh, thoughts on those comments related to labor options for women and sort of uh, in focusing on the empowerment issue rather than just um, maintaining labor uh, options. Carol, you want to start? 
Well, I'm wondering what he means by the negative consequences of women's economic empowerment or, or economic, yeah. So to understand that better first, I'd say. I think part of the question involves if, if say you eliminate the need for labor, but women were making some income based on that labor, how do you, how do you become more efficient? without the unintended consequences of eliminating some of the tasks that women were performing. Do you think that's a part of your question? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand his question. So maybe he could clarify that. Unless Helga, you understand what he's asking? Uh, not entirely, but I can <laughs> maybe say one thing that uh, when women work on men's fields as day laborers, it means that they are late in their own fields. And so if labor saving uh, equipment uh, allows them to work in their own fields earlier uh, and, and therefore get a better um, yield and better crop um, and access maybe the market earlier when um, other people are not yet there, that could be part of economic empowerment and a positive impact. Um, I'm also not quite sure, you know, um, we, we, sh we didn't talk at all about aspirations of, uh, of the youth, for example, in rural areas. Um, there, is, um, a, there is an aging population in rural areas in Africa and um, the young try to find jobs, of course, in the more urban centers. And only, at least in Kenya, I've noticed that the middle class that's really increasing rapidly in, in number and on size uh, invests back in the rural areas. So they would hire labor. Um, but it is not necessarily an aspiration of young people to, to remain unless there is, um, there is hope that they can work with farming as a business. And by the way, there's an excellent TED talk, if any one of you is interested, um, by Vanessa Mukhebi, M-U-K-H-E-B-I, uh, on the youth uh, aspirations and, and youth um, prospects of farming as a business. Um, I, yeah, and so to me, it's not mutually exclusive. If you uh, develop labor saving technology, what is really important is that it has to be suitable for women and it has to be affordable. So even if it's something that a woman's a women's group can uh, use jointly, uh, that would be, to me, a benefit rather than hiring yourself out as, as day laborer. Well, and I just would add sort of something that actually Helga uh, mentioned in her, in her um, presentation is that I think this also, if we have improved technology that maybe reduces the time that women are spending um, doing the various roles that they're engaged in, um, and then maybe that gives them more time to work on males fields. We, there also needs to be that boys and uh, men engagement to understand all of the other things that women are doing in the household and that how, um, you know, more time isn't necessarily more time for, for doing that kind of work, but more time for working on their own fields and um, in, um, increasing the, the economic benefit to the household as a whole. Uh, another, uh, well, as a follow-up there, I did see that, that uh, Krista helped, helped us clarify the question about basically avoiding or mitigating the losses of employment options for women if you do improve uh, labor-saving devices, for example. So it's kind of a question about the quality of labor if they're being uh, losing options for paid labor that may be sort of drudgery or, or lower quality labor, but then losing uh, labor options entirely if, if you go to mechanized production or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, and I gather that uh, Daniel was uh, amenable to, to Helga's response. So I think we'll, we'll move on to another question that um, uh, actually Daniel had early on about if anyone had experiences with knowing if women, um, Carol had made several good points about women's particular interest in traits around variety selection and if 
we knew much about availability of those seed varieties for women and how they're available as compared to like the certified seed or the, um, you know, we, I think you made it an excellent point too. And we're definitely uh, uh, a bit engaged in it in terms of, you know, breeding targets that only focus on yield, for example. And so therefore the varieties that get released are focused primarily on yield, whereas some of the other traits around quality or seed size or, or fat content that may be desirable for different markets. So I, I think Daniel's question is about, do we, do we know much about availability of seed or uh, experiences in seed generation for targeting uh, women in particular? Well, um, from the research that I did for this particular value chain, I didn't, I didn't find anything that specifically was looking at women's traits. Um, I did some research on some other value chains, um, and um, some, of, some of that was, was, there was some involvement in, in looking at, at how the traits that women wanted, this was for, um, in legumes, you know, how like cooking time um, and taste, etc., cetera, um, were things that women wanted. But it, again, what I found particularly in this value chain, was that um, the research is geared towards those high yields and high value markets, um, not necessarily accommodating for women's smaller land sizes and for what they want. So um, while it might be out there, I didn't find that in the research that I, that I had done. Mm -hmm. And so I am only aware of a uh, very targeted attempt uh, in the Next Gen Cassava project to translate what uh, women and men prefer into breedable traits, let's put it that way. And that already presents quite a challenge because how do you, uh, you know, translate cooking time or, or taste into a breedable trait? Apparently, I'm not a breeder myself, so I can't say, but the, the cassava breeders were saying that that was not an easy task to, to do. So they have to translate it into something that is, that is breedable, but they are trying to do that. They have done extensive surveys in that next-gen cassava project all over Africa and uh, are, are now encouraging the, um, the breeders to translate this into uh, varieties, into breeding, breeding. varieties. Well, and I just would add that in order for those breeders and researchers to do that, they really have to be able to take the time to understand what those right. contextual issues in whatever country you're working in, um, to understand what men and women are using, if they're the same or if they're different, et right. cetera. Yeah. Good. I, 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 there was one question I thought that was relative kind of a little bit further down on the seat about uh, experience with packaging of seed uh, sizes of seed packages that were targeted for women. And I was curious if, if either of you had experience with that, maybe not in groundnuts. I'm not familiar with that in groundnuts, but maybe in, in other value chains. Um, I, I did a lot of other research for other value chains and I didn't actually come across anything, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening. And I do think that, um, um, I guess in some places that I've, yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm, I'm assuming that it's not necessarily a blanket statement that it's not happening, but in this particular um, value chain, um, that was something that, um, you know, working along with the private sector would be an important consideration for inclusion for women to have um, improved or certified seeds. I have experience with that, but it's a long time ago in Western Kenya, <clears throat> there used to be a project and I'm struggling to remember, was it one, also, oh, um, the, the, the number one, but spelled out as a word, that project, um, that supported uh, specifically small seed packages and uh, small amounts of fertilizer being sold together. And then they uh, showed people how to use the bottle cap, like of a of a Coke bottle, to apply the fertilizer to the seed, and and it was particularly geared towards um, like women's, uh, also small gardens, shambas they're called there, um, and. I, I do know that the uh, uptake was tremendous. People wanted more of it. The, the critical matter was to convince the industry 
to actually sell this, you know, and to uh, to have the distributors to offer this. Um, the incentive at the time was not so much the seeds as the um, uh, traders, the local traders buying big bags of fertilizer and then leaving them open, which of course means, for example, for uh, um, N fertilizer, um, nitrogen fertilizer, that you know, it would all evaporate into the air. And after a while, there was no active ingredient in that fertilizer anymore. So they came from a different approach, but they did do that. They did offer that and it was quite successful. But is it economically viable on a large scale? I'm not sure. The best thing would be to work together with uh, local organizations. And that is what I really want to stress, what Carol said, work together in partnerships with the local organizations that have the capacity and the interest in doing such projects and, and offering such small quantities, because I'm really sure that women and the youth also would go for that. Youth usually have, you know, also very limited, if not less access to land than, uh, than women because it's the parents, you know, who, if anything, allocate something to them. It would also potentially be an interesting entry point for the youth to get into agricultural business in the rural areas to offer these small packages, to organize that and offer that. I'm, I'm glad Helga had mentioned youth there because we did uh, skip over it a bit at the beginning since our focus was gender here. And Daniel, thank you for, for reminding us early on. We do have a, a few more little questions. Um, Amanda had a question for Carol about if, if any of her data was, was uh, primary source data or was it all um, secondary data of the report? Yeah, I, I, this, was, this was secondary um, research. I didn't go to the field for this. Although some of the reports I read were very specific and geared towards, you know, they did they did collect household data, but that was, I read their reports. Mm -hmm. There's a, uh, uh, Krista has a, an interesting one. It's maybe not for this, uh, for this group, but thinking about the challenge of uh, breeding for targets, traits that are maybe different than the ones that we're used to. So breeding for resistance is fairly, well, I won't say straightforward because nothing is always that straightforward, but, but what are the challenges for, from a breeding perspective for um, traits that would be maybe gendered traits or uh, targeted traits for things like ease of processing, cooking? I can think of a, a few things with like, you know, peanuts that are different for maybe shelling characteristics or oil content for the kinds of uh, food that are being prepared can be different. Um, I'm not a breeder either, but I can I can pretend like I'm one on the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there. I guess I could take a stab at that. I, I think I would agree that I think in, in the past most varieties that have been developed have focused more on productivity traits, so how to enhance the yields through less inputs. And and I think there has been a shift, as I think. The global community begins more aware of nutritional value of crops to look at nutritional value. Um, that said, I, I think it's it's fair to say that in almost all cases, uh, consumer preference, at least follow the farmer, has always been considered in, in evaluating varieties. True, and where those those trials have considered gender, and, and having worked in the CJR for many years, I know that there was always a an effort made to make sure there was a good gender balance that representative of the target for those varieties in evaluating materials. Um, and I guess, depending on the crop, sometimes that would involve taste preferences and, and other things, maybe not all the gambit of, of the traits that you want to look at. So, so it was a factored in, but I don't think the breeding programs necessarily develop varieties specific, specifically for those traits. Now, I know that some crops that were processing, I know that Erie and Rice had a project for many years looking at cooking time of rice uh, and had actually calculated the amount of women hours that would be saved by increasing or decreasing the cooking time of, of that crop. And, and of course, you can play around with starch chemistry and other seed characteristics that actually affect the cooking time of, of a crop. Um, 
So I think there are things you could do, and, and I think what's exciting, and I guess it's part of, I guess, what we would hope would be part of our gender effort is looking at some of those characteristics, such as sensory analysis. And I know we've had discussions around the fact that many breeding programs, at least in in ground nut, don't really consider many of those characteristics as they release a variety. And we don't even have a baseline for the varieties that are out there in many of our targeted countries as to what are the preference traits and sensory characteristics, taste, texture, etc. And, and so maybe there is a there's a need to have some more information about that and then see how we can make gains in that area. Well um, we are past our, our yeah. hour we are short on time. I was going to say as sort of a, a my closing thought, um, we had a couple of questions about nutrition um, that were great to see, um, but we're talking about gender today and there's a lot of crossover. Um, we are planning a webinar in the not too distant future focused on nutrition um, uh, with some organizations and industry folks as well. Um, and hope that you'll return for that discussion. That should be um, very interesting. Um, we don't have a date set yet. Um, and remind you that uh, this content will be posted later today if you want to go back and, and take a look at it. Uh, you can Google it or I'll try to send out an email to everyone. Um, do you have any parting thoughts, Helga or Carol, as we wrap up? I just see in the chats that uh, Amanda Davy is saying that IFPRI is actually allowing the use of its draft ProWea and will incorporate feedback into their community of practice. So by all means, if you're interested and willing to use it, then uh, please contact them or find it uh, on their website and, um, and provide the feedback to them. I think that would be wonderful. Thank you, Carol. Uh, no, just that if you, you know, there's a, there's a whole slew of resources at the end of the report that I wrote, if people want more information on this particular um, value chain, and um, that might be helpful to people moving forward yeah. for, for considering gender. Dave, would you like to close us out? Well, um, yes, I would just thank Carol and Helga and, and uh, uh, apologize to Jessica for not being able to have her participate. I think we will definitely make her comments or her questions yes. available as part of the documentation for this. Um, if she's okay with that. If she's okay with that, which <laughs> she will be. Uh, but as Allison mentioned, I mean, having worked in, worked in various countries around the world, you never can depend on the internet. Uh, so we're sorry that we weren't able to have her contribute to this, but uh, we look forward to her to joining the team, and I'm sure she'll she'll be making uh, contributions at that point for sure. Um, I mean, I think you know this is the first of what we hope will be a very productive and, and uh, uh, effort in really looking at gender in terms of ground nut production in our target countries. And, and we appreciate all the inputs so far. Uh, we still have a lot to, to work on. We're looking forward to all the innovative ideas coming forward as part of our calls. Uh, and hopefully we can put together with the help of Helga and other members of our external advisory panel, uh, a very good portfolio of research projects that will hopefully address many of the issues that were raised during this webinar. So we look forward to, to that, and, and I'm sure we'll be having other opportunities for follow-up on this webinar in the future. So thanks, everyone, for participating, and, and uh, uh, we will be in touch, I'm sure. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.